Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, where we share all kinds of tips, advice, and interview guests on all things innovation and leadership in modern marketing. Each episode is a conversation with inspiring people who make wonderful contributions to our knowledge in these areas and spark curiosity and ideas to pursue. Join me, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. People are very much confused out there about what it is they should be doing and why they should be doing it. But I think you also have to um, follow your instincts, do your research, find out what has been working and not been working, especially in communications. And I think I touched on this earlier, is you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You don't always, as much as I'm talking to innovators here, you don't always need to be completely innovative. So come back to simple simpleness and communication and what has worked and adapt that accordingly to the times that we're in but also you know don't underestimate the power of things that have worked for a long long time beforehand Hi there, Innovator. It's great to be back with another episode. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. And I hope you enjoyed my recent conversations with Steve Sims, the author of Blue Fishing, and with Dr. Sandy Everleth, optometrist and digital marketing consultant, as well as master connector. I'm really excited today to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest, Nadine McGrath of Creative Content Co., Nadine has worked in journalism, in public relations and in content marketing for over 20 years and has enjoyed an illustrious career in senior media roles. In fact, I remember seeing Nadine on television interviewing many celebrities and politicians. Today, Nadine's agency addresses a marketing gap for a service that combined PR, media training and content marketing enabling her clients to gain influence and visibility in this ever-changing world of digital media. A quick promotional message from our sponsor, InnovaBiz, where we help coaches and consultants build professional credibility, engage their target audience and connect with their ideal clients. Now I've got something that will help you get clarity about who your ideal client is So take a look at our Marketing Master Mini Class where we take a unique approach to identifying the needs and the beliefs and getting a real deep understanding of your ideal client and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. Access the Marketing Master Mini Class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It's my gift to you, completely free and accessible without even giving away your email. In our discussion today, Nadine talked to me about aligning your why, what, how and who to build a congruent message that you can then share through all the media where you promote your business. She explained how we need to take care not to overly rely on digital marketing and to place the human interactions at the forefront of all our business. And she emphasised the importance of doing good research. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Nadine McGrath. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today from Brisbane in Australia, Nadine McGrath, who's a journalist, a PR consultant, and she also runs Creative Content Co. Welcome to the podcast, Nadine. It's a great privilege to have you as my guest. Thanks very much, Jürgen. It's great to be here. 
Sonia McDonald, who was our guest. Now, I normally say episode number here, but she was on an episode that we have to re-record because of the quality of the recording. So I don't know the episode number yet, but <laughs> Sonia suggested that we have a conversation with you. Nadine, so a big hello to Sonia. Oh, thank you. We've been doing some great work with Sonia. She's um, an excellent leadership coach and, you know, it's been great to take her brand to where the direction we're going. Yeah, and we had a wonderful conversation. It's just the recording didn't work out, so we're going to redo that in December, I think, and um, looking forward to that again. Nadine, you started out in a career in t- as a TV reporter, progressing to senior roles with News Limited and with Australian Associated Re- Press, and you've reported on a whole range of different things and, in fact, interviewed people from royalty to prime ministers. Now, I know that I've seen you on TV and I've seen you do interviews. So I'm kind of kind of a bit intimidated today to interview someone who's got so much experience in interviewing. But um, it's really great to speak to you in a two-way person-to-person environment. And, um, of course, I, I've got an out because I like to call these conversations and not interviews. <laughs> Um, Now, today you work with purpose-driven leaders to help them get their stories out into the world in a way that creates impact and that they can have impact with what they do. Now, before we start talking about all things media stories and PR, tell us a little bit about how you did get to where you are today and, and what some of the pivotal moments were. It's an interesting journey. It's been a really interesting journey. And I want to sort of start back in the days, I know it seems a while, of when I was at university. And I'm old and I'm probably giving away my age here, but it was in the 90s or in the mid-90s. And I remember being in a lecture theatre and the lecturer was saying the internet was coming and it was going to change the face of media and marketing forever, that we were going to have 24-hour news cycles, that we would see marketing going from particularly from mainstream media and television to digital or anything. And at the time, I remember thinking it was a bit of science fiction, I suppose. And, but <laughs> then, we went, and then we went on and my career progressed and I started off, as I said, in television journalism down in Victoria, actually, and then moved up to Queensland where I worked um, with News Limited, Australian Associated Press, and then into public relations. And I also had some children among there, and I kind of thought, wow, the media really is changing and I need to, I suppose, future-proof my career. And what am I going to What am I going to do? What do I want to do? And how am I going to go from here? So I learned a fair bit about um, content marketing. I did a lot on this rise of digital and the 24-hour news cycle. And and then I thought, wow, what I really wanted to do was help purpose-driven leaders or leaders, I suppose, to tell their stories, whether that be not just in the media, in mainstream media, but also online in this new digital realm. And that's what I'm doing now along with um, my partner with our sister firm, K by Design. She's big into quality management and big into strategy. So we sort of take people all the way to ensure that they're PR ready and that they've also got that really strong presence online and also offline to, in the end, um, to sell their products, to sell their services, I suppose. Mm, yeah, that's great. And and we were having a conversation before we started recording about uh, the rise of digital and how people tend to perhaps over rely on digital in their marketing or PR or whatever that might be. So give us your take on that because I think you know there's there's a lot there that's consistent with my message about building relationships with people and making it all about a human to human interaction and forgetting about how you do that is kind of secondary. Yeah, I think so. One of um, it's really important. We have done a lot of work with different clients, and I've also you have to remember that my background too is first and foremost will always be in research and talking to people and investigating people. So investigating different things that have happened. So (laughs) I've sort of been watching this rise of digital over the last ten or so years, and 
I've also spoken to people who've spent a lot of money on SEO, a lot of money on websites and Facebook, you know, like all of the various platforms. And I've realised that while they might have this strong presence, they might have even the high SEO rankings, when it actually comes to the crunch, what is it they actually do is not communicated still really well. So people might be Mm. going there and they're just going, I still don't get what you do. (laughs) I still don't know how you're going to help me. I'm still not sure whether your values are going to align with my values. And that's all the crux because in the end, language is important. It's there, but you can't mathematize or you can't code language. So, and that's what SEO, a lot of that's trying to do. And it still has a role. I'm not saying it doesn't have a role, but we as human beings, we as people in computers or in science, we still haven't got that right yet and there's still Mm. a lot of work and there's that balance that we have to get right because in the end of the day you know it's going to be whether I want to be on your podcast or if I want you to buy something from me or anything we've got to have that connection and that human connection and so that's the really challenge I think for businesses to realize even if you're in innovative business that's right. Yeah, I, I, um, I guess I'm dating myself a little bit here as well. I remember in the early '90s when the internet was coming out, and I was working in the corporate world, and I thought this is magic. There's all this information there, and I found that all the search engines at the time. I, I remember this time I was trying out all these different search engines. I thought, you know, there's all this information out there, but how do you get at that information? How do you actually find it? And struggled with all kinds of different things and was never really happy and then one day I discovered and it would have been 90 uh, must have been 95 or 96 um, Google came on as kind of a beta program and somehow I stumbled on it and I thought this thing's actually pretty good I'll keep an eye on this one and within a year or so it became my default search engine what's happened in the meantime of course I mean we know all about the rise of Google uh, I think the whole SEO industry was built around how do you trick the algorithms at Google into ranking your site highly? And of course, then Google keeps changing the algorithms to prevent people from tricking the system. And I think that defeats the whole purpose because it misses the point of what you're saying, that connection. And I think it's improving a little bit now, the SEO um, industries changing a little bit, but it does have a really bad name for um, spamming yeah. the system. They call it black hat tactics, I think. Even the things that are not against the rules as such, but are against the principles. You know, how do you, how do you, and I've seen some examples of this where there'll be a page that has a whole lot of keywords on there and they rank really well. But it's exactly what you said a few moments ago is I still don't know what you mean. This was so bad that it was like I I don't even understand this from um, what it actually is saying because it's just a gobbledygook of terms which are basically keywords that they wanted to rank for. And that's an interesting thing because people that's the thing, people come in, they're going, well, we rank really highly for these key words, so we rank really <laughs> highly for this. But then you kind of get on the page or you look at that and you go, in some ways you're doing yourselves a disservice because it's gobbledygook or you're not writing an article that's quality or represents you as a brand or represents you as a person and your expertise and your knowledge and I think Google is getting like I've spoken Google is getting better at this and they're getting faster and they're recognizing more that quality content is going to outnumber necessarily quantity or anything like that because they want to start showcasing the expertise of people and they're still trying to work out how exactly they're going to do it so it's kind of going to be like the old-fashioned libraries of where do you go for the expert to find the right advice. Who do you, con- you know, like, and how are they presenting mm. that information? And so I think you and I in some ways are the best, and I have younger interns as well, those millennials and, you know, Generation even said, you're kind of teaching them in some ways we're still lucky and fortunate enough that we remember the days pre the internet 
or anything where you actually had to do your research, you had to read the newspapers, you actually had to talk to people to find things out. But we've also got that balance of the internet as well, where we've got the click of a button and we can find information available. So Mm. it's going to be when you have just that huge amount of blogging, the huge amount of content coming through every day on anything, on the platforms, on the internet, how you're going to stand out is more and more going to be reputable content. That's, and that's what the research and that's what is showing more and more. Yeah, of course, that's one of the big challenges these days with the amount of information that's available out in the internet and um, the amount of noise there and you know, the reliability of that information is how do you stand out when you're in a position of, okay, I'm going to put out some information there that hopefully will contribute some value to, to my audience. So what what's your process? How do you kind of start off if I come to you and say, hey, I've got a message to get out into the world, what, what should I do? Oh, that's an interesting one. Normally I would refer you to, first of all, I'd sit down and I'd work with my um, partner I suppose and things and we go with K by design and we look at the strategy as an all we take you back to the very basics of what is it you do why do you do it what's your business do you know what I mean and we kind of work Mm. through all of that what has been working so far for you what hasn't been working where's your target market and we do all of that kind of research and we look at where you know how we things can be improved Sometimes it's a case of actually having to rebuild a website or restart it, but we also look at offline as well. We don't just go, not everything for us is online anymore. It's Mm. just we look at other ways in which we can even connect people to people and go, this person would be good or why don't you look at this industry or anything like that. And that's a fortunate thing of us is that we have those connections and we also have that idea that we can kind of go, look, you know, we need to do some of that stuff online and we've got the resources and the capabilities to do that. But let's also look at other avenues as well and we make sure that you're beyond, I suppose, um, digital. We look at, okay, so once someone comes to your website or whatever it is, once people want to do that and they want to, are you sales ready? Are you marketing ready? How are we actually going to talk to them as a person? Mm. so you know it's also that as well yeah i love that approach and and particularly you know starting off with why you're in business and what is it you specifically do and then looking at who is the target audience that you want to speak to who is the ideal customer that you can actually influence and help um, and then knowing all that and looking at the different ways that you can reach them, whether that be digital or in person or in group training or whatever it might look like, um, allows you to keep that uh, congruent message coming right through. And then, you know, we don't have that situation like we were talking about earlier where you, you see something from someone, you say, well, I still don't understand what you do. <laughs> and it's funny, actually, it's mainstream media too, but... Sarah's really good at this is sometimes their target audience we work out after a few days sometimes their target more audience isn't their target audience so what they (laughs) think has been their target audience all along you kind of go actually you have a really good product that would actually suit here do you know Mm -hmm. what I mean like this this is let's try that and you know so it's kind of like looking yes I suppose people will say like the lowest hanging fruit or anything but it's like where can you really add value and where are people where's an industry that is really in need of your services and your innovation or your what you're doing and that comes back to people Hmm. That's right. Talking to people and understanding what their needs and what their pains might be, but also what what their aspirations are and seeing where there's an intersection there with what you do. Yeah. And I love doing that. I like connecting people. I guess I'm a bit of the connector. So, you know, and that's (laughs) something that within reason, um, you can't always have the computer doing particularly well. Yeah. 
That's right. Yeah, the computer, it's it's one of those things, what is it, garbage in, garbage out. So the computer is a machine that basically just, well, it's, it's supposed to do what you tell it. Sometimes I wonder whether it, it's paying attention yeah. when I want it to do something, but um, yeah. It's still mathematical. It's still coding. I love exactly, watching. We've yeah. got some great web developers who are really, really clever and smart. And Renato, I love watching him and I still look at it and I go, Renato, it's still coding. <laughs> it's still, you know, <laughs> and that's why we've got to try and get that balance there of, you know, the, the, um, for my clients, a lot of the articles that go up, they'll be, we'll do some for SEO and then we'll also do some that are purely that, that are there, but are all there for once people are on there for the human touch of it or the human mm -hmm. side of it, they might get printed off or they might get read in other ways, yeah. you know, so yeah. in a magazine, because another thing I don't like to believe, and I think it's really sad for humanity if we do go down here and it's something that I'm, considering working of is I don't believe that everything should be written to a low literacy level or that people don't have the concentration to wait, read a thousand word article or a 2000 word article. I think that as human beings, I hope we've evolved enough to believe, you know, <laughs> to be able to concentrate and to do that. And especially with the, some of the companies that I work, which is highly technical or anything, they're going to be the people who will be buying their services or who will be buying their software or anything need to be able to understand it. So you need to be writing to their technical level, you know, and mm. um, so that's that's what I mean. You have to write to audiences. You don't write for computers. Yeah, yeah. And and clearly, you know, there's a big message in there in terms of knowing who your audience is. So if you're, um, you know, if you want to sell toys to children, then you speak to children. And if you yeah. want to sell a, a complex technical product to people that are looking for that type of product and that have a an understanding of the complex technology, then you can talk to them about the technology in their language. Yeah, and I think that's where my journalism hat comes on and I always try and tell people because as journalists, like every journalist, like and this is where I take people back and I kind of go, well, the ABC, SBS, you know, nine, whatever it is, or across the, the different periodicals or the different newspapers, they all have their target audience. So they'll all write slightly different, but you're always really cautious and you really know and you have to really do your research to know your target audience. And that's what I think we're lacking for the that's what we're lacking on the internet it's another medium it's another and that's where I like to say it is another way of storytelling it is another you know but it is still a medium so you still need like I love teaching people how to write that's one of my things I love mm. teaching them about public relations and teaching them you know their jargon that you need the jargon sometimes you don't need the jargon but it's knowing that you need to know how to be able to do this. So, and I listened to a really great um, interview recently where someone like one of the big innovators over in Silicon Valley was saying that he actually sends, they actually send some of their great technicians, their software developers or anything, they actually send them to do a graduate diploma of journalism and communications mm. so that they know how to communicate. And they learn how to write and they learn how to talk because mm. it's great to have all this technology, great to be able to do <laughs> yeah. this, but you need to be able to communicate it. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I love your analogy with the, uh, particularly the um, news in the different television stations. And I know it never dawned on me this, but I, I know I'll watch news on, and I won't name the channels. I'll watch news mm -hmm. on one channel and I'll, I'll think, oh, that is so awful. You know, so I judge the quality of the news and then I'll go on another channel. I say, oh, that's, that's so much better. I really enjoy that. And I'd never thought of it in the terms of their actually, that one that I think is awful. I'm not their target audience. They're pitching mm -hmm. to a different so therefore that's what they're presenting the what that audience expects whereas the one that i think is wonderful i'm their target audience and so they're doing a great job they're both doing a great job of pitching to their target audience and in in that 
um, filtering out who you don't want it in your tribe or in your viewership in this case is actually part of doing that. And I think we tend to forget that. It's really that if anyone can take that away from your podcast today, that's how you've got to kind of just take it back to basics and think very much like that. It's kind of like just remember who's your target audience. It's like what movie I like might be a different movie to what you like or what TV show or anything like that because and that or news. So it's kind of got to be that's the target audience. People are creating these for their target audience and that's what we need to do with our sales process, without any marketing material, with public relations or storytelling. Hmm. when we come to present yeah. our work. Yeah. Now, you've mentioned storytelling a couple of times, and I did want to explore that in a little bit more detail. So, um, and you mentioned, you know, that it's really important to build those human relationships, and we've been telling stories for ever since, ever since humans kind of evolved, mm -hmm. I guess. And how do you go about telling stories in business that kind of doesn't look like you're just kind of relating a story. I love storytelling. Well, first of all, I, I suppose in some ways I take the news hat on. I like talking to people. So, and I put then on my news judgment. So I might talk to you for an hour or something about like what it is as a founder or as a director, you know, or anything like that and go, why have you started this company? What is it you're doing? What was in your background? Da, 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 da. And we'll just have a conversation, a human conversation, and I'll dig a little bit and then go, okay, that's it. That's my news. That's our angle that we'll have. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we sort of, I guess that's how we, people, that's how we get our news story. And that's just that one sentence and things will flow off from there. And people talk a lot about storytelling in business and there's lots of different formulas. Again, I think we live, it's really quite funny. We live in um, an era where people are trying to code or to systemize things. Like this is how you tell a story and this is this and what type of person, are you know, like storyteller are you and this. And, and it's, I think we don't need to overcomplicate things. We just need to come back to basics. So to give an example, I did a story, you know, I did some bios and a story for a company earlier this year, but it was one that has stood out for me this year. And it was about the CEO was telling me they'd had lots of different companies over the years doing their work. But the CEO was telling me that, I said, how did you get involved in the company? How long have you been there? Da, 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 da. And he told me that he had actually, was one of his first jobs out of uni. And he'd been, he'd climbed through the ranks, basically. So he'd worked mm -hmm. and the other person who'd given him a job had retired. And so now he was at the helm. And I thought, that's an amazing story because he has been right through various positions in this company and that was a human side of that story of who he is do you know and what he had mm. done and so people can connect to that and it humanizes yeah. him more than just I am this this and this I have this qualifications I've done this and my aim for this company is to be this you know it's like that's a human side and that's what they're the little nuggets that I call them gold when I find mm. things like that I just kind of go, they're the great things that I love to find. Hmm. So what's important there for me, I think, is doing the research into who who that person is and what makes them unique. How do you suggest someone goes about that for themselves to identify whatever that story angle might be? Because I was having a conversation earlier this morning and and. Um, about uniqueness and one of the things that I always find myself is that there's a whole lot of little things that we know or have done that we kind of take for granted. In fact, they, they get suppressed into our unconscious and we do them on a day-to-day -day basis and every now and then somebody will say, wow, how did you do that? And that is just amazing and for me it's almost automatic and, and yet that might be something that 
could be a, a story angle. How do you go about identifying that for yourself? Um, I think sometimes you need someone, you need external review. So you need mm. someone to talk to, you need someone in your little circle who knows you pretty well to go, hey, I'm wanting, if you're safe, a CEO and you're wanting to write a bio or you're wanting to do something or other, you need to talk with, you hopefully have a nice relationship with your team and you're able to talk to them, even your wife or your partner or anything like this and go, what do you think has it been about my career that stood out for you? What type of person am I? You know, and then just dig back to, think back about or think back to your career. How did I become you know, reflect. We never take time for reflection. How am I here? How am I here doing what I am doing today? You know, what were those, look back, it's a bit like those sliding. Do you ever see the movie in the 1990s with yeah. Gwyneth Paltrow with sliding doors moments? And, and it was a really good one and you kind of just got to take that back and you kind of go, what are the sliding door moments of my life or what are the things that made me become an entrepreneur or an innovator or anything? that did that mm. and they're sometimes those little nuggets or who were my mentors in life who did I admire who did I want to be like or who are the people that kind of contributed to who I am today and it might be a lecturer it might be for me storytelling was a bit it was a good friend of my father's who ran a country newspaper in Victoria and I used to love he still writes and he's innocent, but I used to love the way he writes. I used to love going in, hanging out on the holidays and looking mm. for that news. Do you know what I mean? Or anything like that. And they're yeah. sort of the things that make you as a person. Mm. Mm, that's great advice. Yeah. Outside perspective is always really valuable and um, that's where yeah. you come in as well, right? Yeah. And, you know, and there's the same with, what techno or what you're doing like you're innovators why are you innovating how did you see the mm. need for what you're doing what is it that led mm. to that or something yeah 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 well i have a good story about that but we we won't share that here <laughs> oh please do <laughs> can i start interviewing you can i put it on the other side <laughs> <laughs> sure yeah um yeah it's basically my first job so i i was a photographer I am a hobby photographer and I have been for all my life. And I can't remember a time when I haven't enjoyed taking photographs. In fact, there's a f photograph of me as a three-year-old um, when just before we migrated to Australia and my grandmother organized portraits to be done of the family. And as a three-year-old, of course, I was very impatient to sit in this portrait studio and have my photograph taken. So the photographer at the time was very smart and gave me a little film box so this is back in the days of film and to play with and there's photographs of me there using this film box mimicking the photographer taking photos with pretending that this film box is a camera <laughs> so that's one of my earliest memories of of sort of when I learned about photography but my first job out of university and this was when I was in Germany again was with ACFA manufacturing films and doing research into film photography so I thought wow uh, I'm in seventh, yeah. seventh heaven here this is fabulous and within six months the first digital camera was uh, the first consumer digital camera was launched at the big um, show and then I lived through how um, ACFA at the time reacted to that and in fact I was on a task force to analyze this digital camera and make recommendations and part of our recommend well our recommendation the report basically said that the quality of this was nowhere near where film is and then we went on to say but it's proof of concept and we saw that the way things were developing and the patents and things that were out there that we'd found um, that this was going to be a serious threat to film photography and I predicted at the time that within 20 years it could be mainstream for um, for the consumer market now wow, what, huge. Yes. yeah then what happened was of course that the senior management didn't read past the first bit and said oh film photography is fine we'll just keep making better film and I think the same thing happened at Kodak and Fuji and the other 
big manufacturers and we all know what happened to them and I saw the writing on the wall pretty quickly and moved out of the photography industry into something else. So that that was kind of when I first thought, well, you know, people are going to be innovating everywhere and they're going to be looking for new ways to do things and understanding what you're actually delivering. So ACFA thought they were in the business of making film for photographers but what, and the same for Kodak and the other ones, but what they were really doing was giving people the means to create memories. And so now there was suddenly another way to do this. And mm. I was wrong about the 20 years. It only took 10. So. <laughs> it certainly has changed. And I think I've even seen the changes in film as well throughout, you know, throughout my career. But mm. it's, um, it's interesting. It's become a bit of a novel novelty now, hasn't it? Like It is, yeah. That, it's coming back a little bit. Coming back, and that's and that's an interesting thing too, because print is coming. Print is making a little bit of a comeback as well. So, mm. like magazines and newspapers and things, in some ways as well. People, it depends on what you like. Like if you're tactile and you like being able to hold something or touch something, you know, they're realizing that there is actually a place there. So sometimes I think we find people go all one way and then all of a sudden mm. things are slowly coming back and that's why I think you've we have to be aware of that in you know in our industries and don't discount everything that's right you know, yeah. well one of my clients one of my clients gave me a, a calendar yesterday for 2020 it's a, a huge calendar it's about um what is it a a2 yeah it's, it's wow. really big and it's got these magnificent photos on there and I, I really, I was stunned and, you know, I got a lot of joy out of that and I'm going to hang that somewhere and get a lot of joy out of those pictures. And I thought, well, that's, that's an example of, you know, people going back to something print rather than digital. So it comes back to what we were talking about earlier though, doesn't it, that relying on just digital is not really a good thing these days. Yeah, I think that you, I think it's, um, we can't be complacent. We can't just rely on digital thinking that it's going to be the be all and end all to get us clients, to get us work, to get it, to sell our goods. And I think that we need to think outside. Do you know what I mean? We need to cast our, Hmm. um, our net a little bit wider. And we need to think beyond just beyond just digital in some ways. Digital has a very, don't get underestimated, digital has a crucial role. You still need the social, um, my colleague Sarah calls it social proof. So you still need probably, you know, some type of um, social media on there. You need obviously people are going to google a website and find out what you're Mm. about and so forth but when they're there it's really important that you um, communicate well what you do and it's also and it represents you and then hopefully when you get them beyond that or uh, you have something you're ready to talk to people offline or you're ready to just talk to them offline through connections or other means as well Mm. yeah that's great. Now, as someone who has been in the media, is still connected well to the media, do you have any tips for how how can you get your story into the media? Once you've developed that story and that hook, how can you get some media coverage for that and, and what can you do with that? I mean, why would you do it, first of all? <laughs> okay. So it's really, I call it being PR ready. So when you do want to get into the media, that's when digital does come in handy in that people are going to do their research on you. So people are going to look at your sites, look at if it's, you know, plat- different platforms and so forth. I won't name them, go through them all. And just to see that you are who you are, do you know? They'll do a bit of research. Mm. But when it comes to and you want to look well, you want to look professional, you want to make sure all those things, you know, like your your old-fashioned office or your old-fashioned shop front or anything yeah. looks professionals there. So that's important. But when it comes to the media and when it comes to journal, you've got to realise that the story isn't actually about you. It's about... Mm. 
their audience. They don't owe you anything. They don't have to give a story or anything about your fangducal technology or anything like that. It's about, okay, what is it, how is this impacting their audience? How is this going to make their lives better? Or what is it that you're doing? What's the new story in there? And that's when you come back to your basic, that's when I always come back to like my basic news principles, I suppose. Like, is it new? Is it innovative? Is it, does it affect people at large? Does it, you know, all of those types of things. Mm. And so that's when the story, that's when we actually got have to sort of always think, which we should even, I suppose, predominantly in our marketing material as well, think beyond ourselves and look at an audience at large and go, how is this helping? You know, like what is it that I'm doing that is contributing to humanity or, you know, making the world that little bit of a better place for people? And that's the new stories that we often try and pick up. And sometimes people will come to me and they'll say, I've got a new story, and I'll go, that's not a new story. <laughs> that's not the story. We're not going to put that release out. But then I'll keep talking to them. I'll get to know them. And then I'll go, that's a, they'll tell me something like they'll say, oh, I had a client and this happened with that client or whatever and this is what we did or something. And I'll go, that's our new story. Do you know what I mean? Like that's the angle that we want to take. And so yeah. that's that. And But, yeah. Yeah, well, that's great advice to really make sure it's about the audience and if you're approaching a news journalist it's about their audience and what value you can add and then I guess what's unique one of the things that I think a lot of people forget is and and I'd like to get your comments on that but journalists are looking for stories all the time I mean it's like I talk to my clients about publishing blog posts and they say oh I'm not sure what I I that I've got a story or I've got something to write about right now and we work through that process. But I'm, I'm imagining that journalists are also in that position of always under pressure to I've got to have another story for the next news report or whatever, whatever they're writing for or producing. Yeah, it's an interesting conundrum because on one hand they're 24-hour news cycles now so journalists are under more pressure than ever there's also been enormous cutbacks in media outlets and newsrooms so they sort of um, don't have the time to write a lot of you know good stories so much as well and to do all the investigative journalism that I love and and that is important but so it's sometimes if you can help provide them with a angle or a story that is kind of half there that they can in, do their own research and adapt. Mm. That's actually a really good thing. It's it's quite helpful. Mm. But on the other hand, everyone's wanting to do that. So if you're a journalist, you can end up with hundreds of, you know, um, emails or pitches a day. So that's why it's important that you stand out in there. And there's no guarantees with public relations that it's going to be picked up. But you also have to pick your that's where you gain, you pick your audience. So you kind of pick up the outlets that you think would be interested in your story, you know, like who mm. um, who writes about the work that you do. Look at sort of different things, look at news of the day and sort of keep your eye on the news and go, I know about that. I can provide another angle or something to mm. some, you know, to a journalist on that to take that story further and, and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, great advice, yeah. So help make the journalist's job easier as well as focusing on what value you're adding to their audience. Yeah, and just building relationships as well. Like even if you just, <laughs> you even if they don't use your story or anything, but you can sort of provide them with a little background or lead them in the direction of someone else who can provide more information. But you're front of mind then so they know next time Mm. when there's a story that could be really good for you or you could provide input that it's there it's again with everything we do it's that crucial relationship building Mm. yeah yeah it's a it's a kind of a philosophy that works in all situations isn't it because we can't do everything ourselves no we can't yeah It's, it's really important all right. Well, this has been fascinating, Nadine. I'm, I'm really enjoying this conversation. We could dig so much more into 
relationships in different areas and marketing and PR and um, media, but I'm aware of the time. So I'd like to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation <laughs> round. It's designed okay. to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions. Hopefully you'll give us something to um, inspire the listener <laughs> to go and do something Five awesome is about today. me, Okay, <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> All right. What's the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Ooh, be less innovative. <laughs> Don't mm. try and reinvent the wheel, really. Sort of yeah. come back to... Sometimes, especially in communications and so forth, um, come back to basics and what has worked before. Hmm. Yeah, that's um, great advice. I, I know that a couple of my guests have said, look outside your industry, what's working in other industries and see what you can adapt there. So that's kind of a variant of the same thing, isn't it? And yeah, it is. I think so. Often people are chasing that disruptive innovation and so they kind of drain um, or wash the baby down the sink with the bathwater, so to speak. I think it's because everyone, I think when, we've, like the word disruption has become so used now and everyone's wanting to be a disruptor. But if everyone's a disruptor, you know, <laughs> this is like a question, is everyone a disruptor? Do you know what I mean? Like if everyone's being a disruptor, are we all really disruptors? So it's, The person that's yeah. holding the line becomes the disruptor because they're the outlier. Yeah. You can be an adapter hmm. on the other hand and you can adapt things to work and, you know, like just look at what's working and what's not working and talk to people. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Thanks for that. Um, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Oh probably comes back to communication again communication mm. research and um invest talking to people finding out what has worked for them in the past what campaigns or anything you know has done well for them and what hasn't done well what's working what's not working and just digging that little bit deeper that's mm. how and then yeah. and then coming up with something going let's try this and let's do it differently. Yeah, that's great. All right. Now, do you have a favourite resource that you use most often? Um, are we talking technology? Because <laughs> sometimes it doesn't I have to think, be technology. <laughs> yeah, I think in terms of resource or being more productive or anything, I actually like to disconnect. I like to go offline a little bit mm. and to be more creative. You know, to go for a run is when I often have my best ideas or come up or I'll be stuck on something if I'm writing or doing anything and I'm just like going, I've got writer's block or we're stuck on anything or don't, where am I going to take this or strategy? Oh, that's when I just disconnect. I'll go and hang out with friends or family or go for a run or do something and I'll go, there we go. We've, we've mm. got it. So that's that's yeah. really important to me, especially and all the research is showing that for our brains or anything is that importance of downtime, which I don't think we are nearly giving ourselves enough of these days. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's great advice. And I had a conversation quite a while ago now on the podcast with Dr. Fiona Kerr, who's a neurosurgeon mm -hmm. and has done a lot of research in in this sort of area and one of the things she said was that you know give yourself time to daydream and and have that disconnection because that way it allows the unconscious to actually start processing all that stuff that is that you think might be blocked right then and there yeah and i had a really interesting conf um conversation yesterday with a man who's now in his 70s but he's been doing he's been mastering something you know how you hear the ten thousand hour rule of just mastering mm -hmm. something and taking the time to really master something and that's what he's been doing for the last 10 years when it comes to artwork and painting and he's been documenting his journey the whole long mm. all along the way so and it was just sort of fascinating and he was sort of even saying that we're not giving and i think this is a bit of a danger for all of us as humanity and for our children or anything is we're not giving ourselves enough time to daydream we're not giving ourselves enough time to master things because we want to do everything 
straight away. And as innovators, yeah. it's really important that we do do that. We do realise that, you know, things take time. Rome, the old saying, Rome wasn't built in a day, yeah, is actually yeah, right. really still relevant in this fast-paced mm. digital age. And we have to go, yes, the world's moving fast, but we can, it, we can give ourselves permission to slow it down. Mm. That's right. And and when we come up with solutions to something that, that we're stuck on, then, of course, it's actually productive time as well. So we can kind of look at it and say it, it can be productive time and it can give us time to yeah. recharge as well. Yeah, All right. that's what... Yeah, I try and look at it that way now. It's still yeah. practice for me too. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it still yeah, takes I try. A lot of practice for me. I still have to um, discipline myself to say, okay, let's shut the computers down. Let's go out and do something else. So I often go um, bike riding, and if I'm on my own bike riding, that's where I get lots of ideas. And... Yeah, yeah, sound like very much. All right. Like what's me. The, yeah, what's the best way to keep a project or a client on track? Oh, I do have clients that go off track <laughs> quite regularly. <laughs> but I think you've always got to kind of pull them back in and go, okay, what's your mission? What's your vision? And what was the strategy? What was the strategy that we started off with from the start? And then we're trying to go, how's that going? And is that strategy working? Then we need to come back to that strategy and go, you know, having a map I suppose I mean the map can change mm. along the way and it's got to be a bit fluid but if you have if they have sort of like a guidance and they know how you know this is our plan then that seems to be a little bit of my way to keep them on track yeah mm. so keeping keeping the whole vision and the end that they're trying to achieve in mind and then looking at the process <laughs> always yeah yeah all right and what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? We have touched a little bit on this. To differentiate themselves? Um, yeah. I think they need to look a little bit about themselves as human, as human being, their background, because no one's background is the same. No, everyone's mm. journey is just like your fingerprint or your thumbprint, and so it's all going to be very different. So they need to look at the human side. What is their organisation doing that's different to anyone else, even from their competitors? And they need to sort of nail that down. How are they servicing people differently? And then they just sort of need to, that's the way in which they need to sort of look at how they're differentiating themselves, I suppose. They need to just go, how am I different? How's my background different? How are my qualifications different? How's our technology different to anything else? And then they need to communicate that. They really, That's where it comes back. They need to be able to yeah. communicate that well. Yeah, well, that's, and you've given us quite a bit of advice on how to communicate <laughs> that. But I guess the, the self-awareness is always a bit of a challenge to really understand how am I different. Uh, but I love the analogy of the fingerprint. So, mm -hmm. you know, your fingerprint, your DNA is unique. So, therefore, you are unique and different. So, be aware of what that is. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks, Nadine. This has been really great. Now, where can people find out more about you and maybe even get in touch and say thank you for what you've shared with us today? That's fine. Um, if anyone wants to come on, I've got my Creative Content Co. website. So that's just www.creativecontentco.com.au. And then if we're still, it's a bit like the plumber's house, there's going to be like McGraw Media arm of that <laughs> as well, which is sort of the main company, I suppose. And that's more the public relations side that I do. I'm also on Twitter and I'm also on LinkedIn. We'll post links to all of those in the show notes and uh, people can reach out. That would be great. I always like hearing um, people's stories and, you know, if I can be of any help, then so that would be lovely too. Great. All right. So what's the number one piece of advice you'd like to leave our listener today, particularly in the area of leadership and uh, innovation? Um, I think that we have to... We have to do our research. This is the thing. You're going to be told a lot of the time 
what it I think people are very much confused out there about what it is they should be doing and why they should be doing it but I think you also have to um, follow your instincts do your research find out what has been working and not been working especially in communications and I think I touched on this earlier is you don't need to reinvent the wheel you don't always as much as I'm talking to innovators here you don't always need to be completely innovative so come back to simple simpleness and communication and what has worked and adapt that accordingly to the times that we're in but also, you know, don't underestimate the power of things that have worked for a long, long time beforehand. Yeah, yeah, that's great advice. And, and I think hopefully all, all my audience know that, you know, innovation could be a huge disruption and a huge change, but it doesn't need to be that. It could be just a little bit of a tiny improvement one day that makes a big change, or it could be going back to, the basics and fundamentals and stripping out all the stuff that's been added on um, over years that, you know, often if you ask why, why do we do that bit, um, nobody knows. And then if you pull it out, there's no real reason to do it. And by pulling it out, you actually improve the system. Yeah. And I think that's, um, that's sort of important you know like I think like I love how you said then too that innovation doesn't have to be massive disruption it can be just Mm. little increments and it can be little increments at a time yeah and that constant you know constantly learning and constantly improving Mm. all right well finally Nadine who would you like me to chat with on a future Innova Buzz podcast and why (laughs) I think I'd probably suggest if having a, start, a chat to Sarah Kay, my business colleague from K by Design, because I think she's always in quality. Her background is in quality management, but she also is really good when it comes to she's quite innovative herself and she thinks outside the box and she's done a lot of research, especially around this digital, the digital space, I suppose, and she's pretty good at finding out, good to know what she, businesses are doing right these days and what businesses could improve upon to help Mm. themselves to get some, you know, deals across the line. Okay, that sounds good. So we'll get an introduction to Sarah from you and look forward to (laughs) chatting with her as well. No worries. Thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights with us today on the Innova Buzz podcast. I've really enjoyed this and learnt a lot and it's been great to meet you. As I say, as I said earlier, I've seen you on TV before and I've seen you do interviews. So it's great to kind of have a conversation with you in person. Yeah. And all the best for the future and let's keep in touch. Thank you. Thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed that really engaging and informative conversation with Nadine and took something away from what she shared with us today. She shared so many valuable insights on getting your voice heard and gaining visibility that apply across the board in all business. What stood out for me was her focus on doing good research first, which is something that often gets overlooked in today's rapid response, always connected online world. I'd love to know what you took away from Nadine's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Nadine McGrath. That is N-A-D-I-N-E-M-C-G-R-A-T-H. All lowercase, or one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Nadine McGrath. When you go there, you'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Nadine, as well as links to the Creative Content Co. website, to her social media pages and the other resources that we spoke about in today's conversation. Nadine suggested we have a chat to Sarah Kay of Sarah Kay Designs on a future Innova Buzz podcast episode. So, Sarah, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Nadine McGrath. 
Remember to check out our Marketing Master mini class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It's my gift to you, my listener. It's free and completely accessible without giving away even an email. But most importantly, it'll help you gain absolute clarity about your ideal client in a very unique way. A lot of depth of information there that will help you communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. And if you'd like our help to go even deeper into Marketing Mastery, or indeed if you want help in producing your very own podcast, then send me an email to jurgen at innovabiz.co and we'll set up a quick call just to have a conversation and find out if we're a good fit for one another. Tune in again next week to the Innova Buzz podcast. We've got some more fantastic guests lined up, including Elsie Flennard of Enterprise Now and April Sprints of Driven Outcomes. Stay connected with us by subscribing to the Innova Buzz podcast at innovabuzz.com forward slash subscribe. I N N O V A B U Z Z dot com forward slash subscribe. Make sure you never miss another episode. It would also mean a lot to me if you leave us a review because what you think matters. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your ideas, your suggestions or questions you have. So go ahead and share them in the comments below the blog post for this episode. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating. Innovabiz.